We will now reconvene to open session at 7 p.m. Item number five, Pledge of Allegiance. Ms. Gamboa, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Of course. Please stand and join me for the pledge. Thank you. Roll call will reflect that all board members and cabinet are present. Moving on to item seven, approval of minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the regular meeting of October 11, 2022? So moved, Linda Porras. Is there a second? Second, Trisha Pierce. It has been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the regular meeting of October 11, 2022. Yes, 2022. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? This motion carries. Moving on to number eight, board meeting agenda. Superintendent Dr. May Vollmer, is there any agenda to tonight's agenda? No, there is not. Perfect, thank you. Moving on to item nine, approval of agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda of the regular meeting of October 25th, 2022? I make a motion, Tricia Pierce. Is there a second? second? It has been moved and seconded to approve tonight's agenda. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? This motion carries. <laughs> Moving on, item 10, community staff student recognition. Superintendent Dr. May Vollmer. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to invite Sean Webb, the Director of Community Engagement and our Educational Foundation up to the podium to make some announcements. Excellent, thank you. Good evening, school board, cabinet, and DSUSD community in the audience. And uh, I got some exciting news to share. Since the inception of the DSUSD Recognize It program in August 2019, over 2,500 staff members have been recognized for having incredible talent by their peers, colleagues, and students and families. So I think that's pretty amazing. I think that deserves a round of applause in itself. So with each month, uh, staff members, community members can nominate uh, for a staff member having incredible talent. And for the month of September 2022, we had 63 staff members that were nominated. And as everyone knows, uh, the nominations then go into an electronic wheel where we draw during classroom conversations, where we draw two of them where they will, they will receive a CV harvest box. And this month, we have two winners. One is a Gerald Ford Elementary School teacher, Jacer Gutierrez, and he was nominated by a family. And I wanted to share some of the comments the family said. Mr. Gutierrez is, is an excellent teacher. The detailed communication daily between teacher and parent is incredible. Mr. Gutierrez is very respectful, caring, and patient with children. I've shared the same teacher with other parents for the last couple of years, and I know they have also shared the same excitement and gratitude. Thank you. The next person is also uh, a staff member at Page Middle School, and this is Carrie Sperber, principal. She was nominated by a staff member, a fellow colleague. Mrs. Sperber is a visionary leader who is able to build a space where multiple voices and visions can be crafted into one set unifying beliefs serving our students and families. I appreciate everything that she brings to our campus. Her support will make me a better educator. Thank you, Mrs. Sperber. Please give them a round of applause as I know both inform me tonight they would not be here when they're watching on YouTube. And lastly, I want to invite the board, I want to invite the cabinet, and all of the community here. We have our first Foundation Express event, our first Foundation, foundation fundraiser next Sunday. It's called the Foundation Express. You can go to foundationexpress.us. You can look it up, but we're starting off at two beautiful galleries along El Paseo, and we're going to raise money for art education. So we invite you to come. Thank you very much. Moving on. Moving on to item 11, introduction of new or recently promoted employees, Superintendent Dr. May Vollmer. Um, yes, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hyde. Thank you, good evening, board. Um, I'm happy to announce we have two uh, introductions. I'd like to uh, introduce Joshua Howitt, a new mental health therapist. Joshua, are you here? Please step up to the dais. Okay. 
So I'll, I'll begin and I'll introduce Josh as he makes his way up to the dais. Joshua earned his master's degree in social work from the University of Southern California. He's a licensed clinical social worker who has served the men's program as the men's program manager at Coachella Valley Rescue Mission, working with the homeless, the mentally ill, and those suffering from addiction. He has also served as a clinical therapist in the Youth Hospital Intervention Program with Riverside University Health Systems Behavioral Health to assist youth in eliminating suicidal and self-harming thoughts and behaviors, preventing psychiatric hospitalization, improving family systems, and developing healthy coping skills to enhance stability and mental health wellness. Joshua enjoys family time, hiking, hunting, fishing, music, playing the bass guitar, and jujitsu. This evening, he would like to recognize his wife, who is a high school special education teacher with Palm Springs Unified School District, <laughs> as well as his 10-year-old son and six-year-old twin boys who attend Desert Sand Schools. All right, good, good comeback. Welcome, Josh. <laughs> if you'd like to maybe uh, uh, introduce yourself, maybe uh, welcome any guests and say just a few words. I appreciate the opportunity and I'm looking forward to this appointment. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's been my dedication recently uh, to work with the youth in the community. Uh, so I, I think I'll be uh, effective with those in the school district. And, uh, you know, if there's anything I can do, my door's always open, unless I'm in a session. So, and I'm an open book. So, any questions? You're welcome, Josh. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> I'm also very excited to announce Danielle Juarez, our new site manager for Nutrition Services. Danielle, come, come to the front, please. Come up to the dais. So Danielle has been employed with Desert Sands in the Nutrition Services Department for 24 years. During this time, she has handled the accounting for all 33 sites, not only maintaining the accounts, but serving as the security liaison, handling any money pickup issues, assisted vendors, and worked closely with the warehouse to ensure all incoming orders had proper arrivals, approvals. For the last three years, she has periodically served as an interim site manager, managing and coordinating food service operations at school sites. You can imagine how challenging that was during the pandemic. Directing staff with site programs, keeping accurate records of attendance, staff and substitute schedules, hiring substitutes, training new employees, reviewing and approving staff attendance and extra duty, and working directly with principals for site-specific needs while ensuring compliance with district, state, and federal requirements regarding public school nutrition. Danielle, congratulations. Please uh, introduce yourself, maybe say a few words, and uh, congrats. Thank you so much. Good evening, board members, cabinet, and our community. I'm honored to accept this position as site manager for nutrition services. I've raised three kids here at Desert Sands and I'm also a product of Desert Sands Unified. The past several years I've been able to work as a sub or interim manager and have had the opportunity to work with our staff, packing lunches, feeding the kids, handing out lunches during COVID. And I've never been more proud to be a part of this team as I have these past few years. I would like to thank my boss, Dan Capello, for putting his faith in me and giving me this opportunity, and also Letty Flores for mentoring me and supporting me. I look forward to doing my part to help the ELOP program run as smoothly as possible. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Moving on to, or actually, does the board and superintendent have a few comments for our community staff student recognition and new recently promoted employees? Ms. Gamboa. I wanna say congrats and that's very cool. You guys, I look up to you guys, so that's really nice to know. That's Thank you. All. Ms. Pierce. Um, I wanna congratulate Joshua Howitt. Um, I listened to your background and I, I'm amazed at how much experience that you you have with the with the community that that really needs the help um, from the Coachella Rescue Mission and so forth and even uh, suicidal youth and I think that you'll be a great fit here and I the more 
uh, therapists and counselors and so forth that we can have here for the kids is something that we're establishing now and can do, and we need to keep it going for all time because it's been really needed. So welcome. And um, Danielle Wars, uh, congratulations um, to be coming up from a student into the workforce and then leading the site manager is really an honor, and I congratulate you on that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Porras. Yeah, Josh, congratulations and welcome to the family. Um, we're much needed, much needed. So we really look forward to um, you working here with us. And Danielle, I am just so proud of you. I've known Danielle since she was like five years old. And um, I just love her so much. And I'm just so proud of you and um, much deserved. And, you know, I just know you're going to do amazing. And so, um, and Dan, of course, you know, great job, Dan. Anyway, I'm really proud of you. Congratulations. Thank you. Dr. May Vollmer? Yes, thank you. Um, obviously, welcome to uh, both of you, one new employee and into your new position. Very, very excited uh, for both of you and very well deserved. So congratulations. I'd also just like to comment on our IT awards, which uh, has nothing to do with technology but stands for incredible talent. Uh, it's, it's really very easy. It's on our webpage. If you haven't seen it before, I really do invite you. Uh, I think that as human beings, we typically don't often take the time to compliment and acknowledge the amazing things that we see every single day. And I think we do. I think we see amazing humanity all around us every day. And so it's on the website. It's incredibly simple. Uh, to go in and to acknowledge something that you've seen and appreciated in any Desert Sands uh, staff member, and I know it makes their day. So just wanted to say thank you to Mr. Webb for acknowledging that and remind everyone that it's on our website. Welcome to everybody, and congratulations on your promotion. It is an example of growing our own, from a student to employee, and you're moving up in the ranks. Congratulations. Um, yeah, you know what, you're right. You're right about recognizing our incredible talent. You know, we say be kind, be thoughtful, be considerate. And many times what we always hear is a lot of the negativity. Yeah. You know, we focus on that. But there is a lot, you're right, there is a lot of good things happening in the district. And there's many people that make this district what it is today. And I think we do need to take time to just recognize people. You know, I think everybody deserves recognition. So I think it is on the website. It's right there in the front. It'd be nice to see like a thousand yeah. things come up in there. That would be wonderful. Make it a little bit harder to choose, but right. yeah, that's, but that's a good, that's a good, that's a good problem. That's good. All right. Moving on to item 12, we have two informational items. And the first one is the La Quinta High School Globe Trotters Club educational trip tour of the Alps and Mediterranean coast. They'll be in Italy and a couple of other countries, July 10th to the 20th. Uh, item number two, 12.2, Palm Desert High School's California Cadet Corps participation in the Community Emergency Response Training in San Luis Obispo, California, November 3rd through 6th. Wishing both these teams safe travels. And gosh, amazing to go. Right. Italy, <laughs> they will have a great time. Moving on to item 13, staff conference items. Dr. May Vollmer, turning it over to you. All right. So tonight we have the pleasure of receiving the ASB report from Amistad High School. And so I will turn it over to our student board member, Zoe Gamboa, to lead us in that report. Is it okay if I go up there? It absolutely is okay. So first, we will be pre presenting our speeches for the ASB report, and then we will show our video, OK? So when I first transferred to Amistad High School as a junior, I had plans for myself. It was very much different than my plans now. I never thought I would be in an ASB class and be class president today. As a freshman and sophomore, I always wanted to do what I do now, and that is being able to show my class that I am a true leader to my school. 
At first, I just felt if, as if I was not good enough to have this position or if this spot is for the more stable. But the moment I transferred to Amistad, the mindset changed. You really just have to be positive with yourself and because of my staff and teachers, I learned to be so much more positive with myself. And it keeps me moving to great things. Sorry. I knew that this is what I wanted. I knew I'd want to be involved in helping the things around me and making sure students leave with a smile on their faces. Something I learned from being at Amistad is everyone notices you. Every staff and teacher wants to know you and they really do make you feel as if you are part. But you do have to let yourself and I allowed myself to be more open because of them. I was able to meet the most incredible staff and teachers and I was able to build a connection with them. I am truly grateful for my ASB teacher, Ms. Para, not because of her title as ASB teacher but because of who she truly is. She has such a big heart and she truly deserves the world because of her I got to take myself back in time and dress as a mascot again. When I, and when I was a freshman, I was the Raja mascot back at Indio High School. And that was the most fun experience to go back in time in the moment. And being in an ASB class gave me the opportunity to communicate with students and teachers every single day. And that really helped me be more confident with myself. There you go. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Kevin Villanueva, and I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about a program I joined. And it's uh, an, automa uh, <laughs> an automotive program, um, part of Amistad. And before I joined that program, I was unsure of what I wanted to do, you know, for a career. And I had multiple ideas and that I'd like to do and ideas that I could realistically do. And I never fully became passionate about a career until that moment. When I started, I was nervous um, because of my lack of knowledge. And I kept going. I picked up skills that helped me throughout my life, helped me in other aspects of my life. I made friends. I become mentally sound knowing what I wanted to pursue in life, right? It's also working a hobby, and it's um, working on cars. and. Um, I started unsure of my future, and now I have a plan, and I've, I even started a business, and it's given me motivation to pursue other things in my life and branch out, and, you know, it's, <laughs> and hopefully, you know, hopefully that leads me somewhere and I become uh, successful, and that's, that's it. So first off, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Viviana Delgado. I'm an ASB student leader at Amistad High School. So when I first arrived to Amistad High School, I was really nervous. I had no idea what my school life had ahead of me, and I was just overall a really shy person. But when I had the great opportunity to join Amistad ASB, I took it. So at Amistad, we have an every quarter event called Eagle Express, where parents can pick up their child's progress reports and a complimentary coffee and bread, and even have the chance to speak and communicate with our um, teachers and staff. So that experience just really helped me come out of my shell, and because of that, I'm glad to be an Amistad Eagle. Thank you. Hello, my name is Natasha and I am an ASB student. When I first arrived at Amistad High School, I was a little nervous with the way teachers would treat their students. But the same day I arrived, I completely warmed up to the school, realizing the teachers were not against me. They were there to help me and to make sure I as well as my peers succeeded. In ASB, we planned spirit weeks each quarter. First quarter was back to school week and this week, this quarter is Red Ribbon Week. During the week, we have days to dress up and activities that teachers and students participate in. ASB does a morning pledge and announcements each day, and this year we started announcing birthdays as well. Um, ASB's goal is to help students feel part of the Amistad community and have the support they need to make it to graduation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Emily. Um, I'm an ASB student at Amistad High School. When I first came to Amistad, I was very nervous and wasn't sure about it. I wasn't sure how the teachers would be and how the overall environment would be. But the more time I was at Amistad, I got to see how the teachers were more involved with students and in helping them succeed in passing their classes. 
When I first came to Amistad, it was my junior year, and I was really behind on my credits. But with the help of teachers, I was able to get caught up on all my credits. I earned 25 credits each quarter and was able to attend the 25 club. It's a club we have at Amistad where students get recognized. This year, I was able to be a part of the 100 club event, another club where students get recognized for their grades. There was 14 students that celebrated earning 100 clubs last year, but there were also several students that earned 100 credits and went back to their home school. This year, I'm looking forward to finishing early and graduating by the end of second quarter. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mario Cavazos III, and I'm one of the multiple ASB leaders who represent our school. For as long as I can remember, I was always, and I'll be honest with myself, I haven't always been the best of students. For as long as I can remember, or sorry about that, the reason I struggled in mainstream education system was because there was just not enough attention towards me, so I really didn't care if I failed. But when I started attending Amistad, I realized that I'm actually more bright than I perceived. The reason I say this is because a lot of teachers at Amistad helped me see the potential in myself that no one else did. One of the many things that ASB students participate in is working at the student store. This helps me a lot when learning customer service because we're constantly talking to students and taking orders from people we might not already know. This is an important life skill that we definitely shouldn't take for granted. ASB provides this and a lot more real life experiences for the students to take advantage of. And for that, we are forever grateful. We hope you enjoyed our presentations. Any questions or comments? Here's. I just want to say I noticed a, a, a common theme here that so many of you were nervous making that transition to Amistad, not knowing what you'd expect. Is it more of the same? But I know with the small setting and the teachers that are so focused on, on the students, you guys felt it. You all felt it and felt like you know somebody is focusing on me, helping me get my goals straight, guiding me to make my choices. And I just loved hearing each of your stories to see that you realized what you were capable of. Thank and you. just working hard. I, I happened to go one day with Dr. G and um, you know, one of the 25 day celebration and uh, I think it was a fruit cup or something. Anyway, everybody was going in there celebrating and that they'd made their 25 units and those little increments and steps leading to what you were trying to get to just help along the way to be recognized and, and seen as a person. Yes. So I really wanna congratulate all of you on being leaders for the school over there and for sharing your experience. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Porras. I just love Amistad. I had uh, two of my sons graduated from Amistad, and I love the family and how you feel like you belong, and that you guys are just so cohesive with each other. And just the fact that you just believe in yourselves, which is the most important thing. So anyway, it was great, great speeches, every single one of you. Great job. Thank you. Thanks. Dr. May Vollmer? Yes, absolutely. A little bit of echoing what's already been said, but... First and foremost, I want to say congratulations to the staff um, at Amistad for creating the amazing environment that we here described here this evening. I know that that takes a lot of heart and a lot of hard work, so thank you for what you do every day for students. And for each of you, I just want to say congratulations um, and also just say how impressive it is to have you stand up and share your experience and even just be the leaders that you are to be here tonight and to stand up in front of everyone and share, that in and of itself is intimidating. So we appreciate that so much. Uh, but just very proud of each and every one of you. Um, each of you talked so much about the staff and your connections there, uh, but I just want to publicly recognize too what in each and every one of you came out in the hard work and the dedication um, and the commitment to yourself to make um, your dreams a reality. So even though the staff worked so hard, I know none of that would have happened without each of you putting in the effort that you did as well. So congratulations. I do want to congratulate you on finding that safe space you needed to thrive because sometimes it's hard to find. 
It really is, and, and, and there's a struggle to that. So I'm glad that you guys feel confident enough in yourself. I know sometimes our voice cracks when we're speaking and you're nervous, but you guys did an amazing job, and I thank you for that. Thank you. And we are ready for your presentation. I um, I'm going to talk slowly while I wait for Zoe to come back up here. <laughs> uh, it's really, it's a great um, privilege anytime we get to engage with our students and hear their voices and gain their perspective. So having our student board members with us for a couple of meetings uh, each each month is really very, very special to us and a great opportunity for us to get to hear more about the great things that are happening um, at our schools, but also what's important to our students and, and what they feel really matters. So Zoe, I just have a, a plaque here for you from the board in our appreciation for you serving as a student board member. And we wanted to say thank you and congratulations. Cool. Thank you. And now moving on to item 13.2, focus on English language arts and mathematical reflection, connection, and moving forward. Dr. May Bomer. I'll turn it over to Dr. Wood. All right, thank you, Dr. Bomer. Well, good evening, everybody. Tonight, Educational Services will present on our district's math and ELA CASP and LPAC data from the 2021-2022 school year. Uh, the data will establish our new baseline as we move forward. Uh, in addition to that, we'll look at, as a result of this data, what are we doing uh, with ELA and mathematics at our elementary and secondary schools. Uh, tonight presenting, we have our uh, coordinator of assessment and accountability, Lee Baird, and our senior directors of uh, curriculum instruction and assessment, Mr. Mike Kent for elementary and Dr. David Gustafson for secondary. Thank you, good evening. Let's take a moment to reflect on the student, excuse me, the student performance <clears throat> on our spring 2022 state assessments. The English language proficiency assessments for California, known as the LPAC, is administered to all English learners every year to measure their progress in learning English and is based on the English language development standards for California. The goal for all English learners is to make measurable progress in learning English each year. When we look at LPAC results, 
We will expect to see students at all levels of English language development, from beginning to well-developed, as new English learners enroll each year and ELs are reclassified each year. This is what we see on the LPAC three-year trend chart. Again, what is important to note is that individual students are making progress in learning English as measured by the LPAC. In 2019, 47.5% of our English learners made progress. In 2022, we predict that the English Learner Progress Indicator, the LP, on the California School Dashboard will reflect that 50.9% of ELs made measurable progress this past year. Last spring, students in grades three through eight and grade 11 participated in the Smarter Balanced English Language Arts and Mathematics Assessments, part of the CASP suite of assessments. CASP data was not reported in 2020 or 2021 due to the pandemic and subsequent assembly bills. As a result, the trend graphs will show 2022 students' results compared to 2019 results and the difference in the percentage of students meeting or exceeding grade level ELA and mathematics state standards. This set of visualizations identify how our students did as a whole, declining 9.2% in ELA, but also show how each of our student groups performed in English language arts. It is clear that most of our student groups have fewer students meeting and exceeding standards than in 2019. The next set of visualizations show how the same student groups performed in mathematics. Our students as a whole declined 10.6% since 2019. We see the same trend with most of our student groups having fewer students meeting and exceeding standards than in 2019. The California Department of Education emphasizes that the state assessment data from 2022 is a new baseline for California. We chose to share it in comparison to 2019 to be transparent about the academic performance of Desert Sands students through the pandemic. We are seeing similar trends across Riverside County in the state. In looking at our data in comparison to the 22 other public school districts in Riverside County, we ranked eighth in English language arts and seventh in mathematics. The last set of slides are quite interesting. iReady, a series of three diagnostic assessments with individualized instructional pathways for students was implemented district-wide last year. We looked at the correlation between student performance on the spring iReady diagnostic test and student performance on the Smarter Balanced English Language Arts and Mathematics assessments. Correlations are important. Correlations are one of the most important or commonly used and widely adopted, excuse me, accepted forms of validity evidence. Correlations demonstrate that when students score high on one assessment, they also tend to score high on the other. And similarly, when students score low on one assessment, they also tend to score low on another. If correlations are strong, we can use iReady as a predictor of how our students will score on the Smarter Balanced assessments. A correlation above 70% is seen as strong by the National Center on Intensive Intervention. This visualization, broken down by grade level, shows a very strong correlation between the two assessments. We see even stronger correlations with mathematics, meaning that student progress and performance on the iReady diagnostics can be used as a predictor of student achievement on smarter balanced CASP assessments. As additional data sets become available, we will share them with the board through Friday letter. And I will turn it over to Dr. Gustafson. So as we consider our current LPAC data and the correlation between iReady and CAS projections, it's important to highlight that we not only have statistically significant data, but we have actionable data. But before we dive into what we're gonna do with our new baseline data, it's critical that we align our work to the six domains of our district's MTSS framework. We recognize that instruction alone is not the only aspect of student learning. The six domains of our MTSS framework 
our teaming structures, school culture and climate, staff and student wellness, data and assessment, best first instruction, and family and community engagement. As you know, each school has a school plan for student achievement, or a SIPSA. This plan outlines a school's goals and how a school will utilize its resources to accomplish these goals. This year, to ensure that we address each of these six domains of our MTSS framework, schools are utilizing a multi-tiered system of support, school accountability plan, or an MSAP. The MSAP ensures that the efforts of a school are focused, they're measurable, and recognize the importance of the MTSS framework. So with our data and our MTSS framework in mind, we now consider our action steps. All right, here we go. <laughs> so as Lee and David mentioned, uh, we're using data and the MTSS framework to create equitable opportunities for all students to thrive and be successful. Just as we started this presenta presentation tonight with data, data and assessment are the engine that drives student learning, and it starts with highly functioning PLCs, also known as professional learning communities. As a district, we use the PLC process at sites ensuring that all students learn at high levels. Grade level teams and department teams engage in the PLC process through collaboration that is built during our district um, structured academic support time, also known as SAST. Focusing on these four questions, what do we want all students to know and be able to do? How will we know if they learn it? How will we respond when some students do not learn? And how will we extend the learning for students who are already proficient? Secondly, as you see here, we're, we are using universal design for learning as our structure to ensure our, we're meeting the needs of all of our student groups, as you've seen in the data, uh, some examples of students with disabilities, homeless, foster youth, socioeconomic disadvantage. This structure provides opportunities for educators to plan for variability, with their learners, as well as planning for barriers that might get in the way. It affords uh, students the opportunity to effective, effectively engage, access, and express learning in different ways by using the UDL guidelines. We've been building capacity with our administrators over the past two years, and we'll be doing the same thing for our educators this year through SAST. And thirdly, as you see here, English learners. Looking at the data, our English learners were the most impacted, so we know we need to provide additional scaffolds and support for our English learners. We have, a, um, we have hired a multilingual coordinator that will be supporting the sites with the integration of our multilingual learner master plan, as well as professional development on the English language development that will be provided as well during our SAS time. As well as, providing an online, as well as providing an online platform called Imagine Learning that personalizes support for all of our English learners in K through eight. Next here, um, I just wanna take this opportunity to share what tier one and tier two supports we're doing for our elementary students. And then after I do that, Dave will talk at, about the secondary. This, the data clearly shows the need for math and literacy foundation skills. So those will be the two areas that we focus on this year, and you'll see those up there. In math, we'll be implementing cognitive guided instruction, also known as CGI, through our professional development. CGI is a framework that helps educators to understand how children's mathematical ideas develop and provide an opportunity to build on the child's own thinking and understanding. This framework provides routines and activities that can be incorporated into the curriculum and the teacher's lessons, as you can see those listed here underneath. Literacy foundation skills is our second focus, and this equips our educators with the best practices, skills, and strategies that are aligned with the science of reading. It incorporates two areas. You'll see them up here. Word recognition is one of them. 
And the other one is um, language comprehension and the skill sets that are underneath those. If we have both of these and we're successful at implementing them, we will have skilled readers as you see at the end there. And of course, at the heart and center of all this work is providing coaching to our educators from our instructional coaches. Next, you will see our tier two supports. Some of these components are, in, are still in the building stages as we're striving to have a universal supports across the district in ELA and math. So for example, right now uh, we have in place, we provided a seven hour intervention specialist to support students who need extra support in ELA and math. And then in literacy, uh, we have two programs, uh, Phonics for Reading 3.5 to support those students that have not mastered those basic uh, reading foundational skills and getting ready to um, roll out the Amplify M class, which is an intervention program for our K2 students. So we're excited about those two pieces. And then in math for those sites um, that have an intervention specialist that are utilizing math. And again, this is still a work in progress. We're using uh, two programs from numeracy consultants there um, to support our K2 and our 3.5. And then uh, the last one there is for our three, five students for literacy and math, providing the FEB tutoring that can be done not only during the school day, but also at home. So just providing a lot of scaffolds and supports for those students and making sure that we have universal systems across the district that um, we can monitor it and see how students are doing. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. G. So we're truly engaged in some great things in our elementary schools. Our secondary schools are also doing some great things. At our middle schools, the use of iReady data and the available tools connected with iReady have become infused into the culture of our campuses. When I stop and I speak to our middle school principals, they simply reply, this is what we do. iReady, along with our committed teachers, support staff, and administrators have created targeted purposeful intervention programs for our students. And that may look different at different schools. For some schools, iReady is, is available in advisory classes, while at other schools, it's integrated into our core classes and even our elective classes. Principals are engaging in data share outs with staff. Teachers are discussing with other teachers student performance and progress during our PLC time. And perhaps most powerful at all, of all, is that our teachers and our administrators are engaging with students and families on their iReady progress. So between personalized pathway lessons and binder reminders, such as the example that you have here where students can track their progress on their iReady, on their iReady data, they'll also have the opportunity to listen to the daily announcements where they're being encouraged each and every day. iReady is truly a priority at our middle schools. And ST Math continues to be an important resource at our middle schools in ensuring that we're moder monitoring student learning as it relates to conceptual thinking in math. And finally, engaging opportunities to strengthen our academic skills are also available through our Expanded Learning Opportunities Program, or ELOP. At our high schools, where one high school in the room had a 98% completion rate on their iReady diagnostics, my former school, Amistad High School. <laughs> Our high schools are also responding to data. For example, four years ago, Palm Desert High School launched Office Hours, an opportunity for students to receive both intervention and enrichment. And this year, we're excited to share that La Quinta High School is now offering Office Hours to their students, which offers those students at those two schools an opportunity to receive extra support in their six period day. In addition, Schools are using iReady data and interim assessments to adjust instruction, increase access to intervention classes, and also participate in personalized pathway lessons. FEV Tutoring is an online tutoring service that Mike mentioned earlier that has a rich partnership with Desert Sands. It started five years ago. This year, FEV began integrating iReady data into their personalized one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions. So imagine a classroom of 30 students. You could have one group in one station working on an independent task, while a second group is working one-on-one with, -on -one with an FEV tutor
based on the, the information that they need from iReady. While a third group is working with their teacher receiving small group instruction. And finally, we have access, increased access to both Apex and Edgenuity courses to assist us with credit recovery and A through G validation. So as you can see, our actions and services that we've shared with you tonight are data driven, they're intentional and comprehensive in meeting the unique needs of all student learners in Desert Sands. With that, we say thank you, and we're here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Ms. Gamboa, do you have any questions? Thank you. Ms. Pierce? Uh, yes, um, for the elementary, I was just curious if um, the phonics for reading and the Amplify that you're gonna be starting in the math uh, intervention ones, are they d during the school day? With yes. your interventionists, okay. Yes. Yep. They'll and then anything that. after school would might be um, the ELOP has some has some type of uh, programs also to help students on that, or is ELOP mostly uh, a, a lot of what's nice about a lot of these programs is they can be extended to the after day after school um, program through ELOP, um, just like through Feb, the Feb tutoring as well. So any of these programs, iReady, um, the uh, phonics for reading and what she had mentioned, the Amplify, all can be accessed um, for students after school as well as during the school day. Okay, and on the middle and high school, um, you know, I always heard FEV tutoring, or is that what you just say each letter out? FEV tutoring, anyway. Um, so I'm so glad to hear that it's tied to the iReady data because I'm thinking, okay, you have to go home and you found out that you're not good on such and such, so you have to look up that standard and ask for tutoring help online. Is there a real person on that line? There is a real person so, online. So I know I've, I've heard of this, so I've never gone on myself. Yeah. So this real person is talking you through that standard or that problem that you don't understand. Right. And um, the ST Math, can you tell me what that is exactly? So I got to see ST Math today uh, at Indio Middle School in a sixth grade classroom. And basically what ST Math does is it drives home the concepts conceptually for kids. So it's more than just your rote uh, memorization like two times two, but it's actually right. understanding in depth what that two times two actually represents and they tricked the kids into learning through really interactive puzzles. The kids were engaged, and the conversations that students are having while they're engaged with the activity, that's incredible. Um, I'll have to so look at that things. too, that's, that's great. And I have gone into some of the schools where they're writing and setting their goals on iReady, and they're, you know, they're having their chunk of time, like they have the little math time, and then the reading time later in the day, or vice versa. And to see that there's something that, I love the way that they can all take a test at the beginning or a placement thing, and then they're not wasting time on things they know. They just go right into where they, they're at. Yeah. So as a teacher before, I loved, we didn't have iReady then, but mm -hmm. what we were using, it was similar, and, and it was so helpful because you knew not everybody was just cruising through. They were really making learning, you know. Yeah. I love this report, and uh, thanks for letting us know about the baseline that we're gonna start fresh and new from here on after this pandemic. So I know we'll do great things and the kids will get back into this. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Thank you, Ms. Borras. This is a great report. Um, I just have to say, Mike, thank you for explaining the acronyms because a lot of times, you guys, I know we've had people come up and say, what the heck does this mean? You know, because it's little letters and it's kind of like teacher talk, you know. So thank you for that. I, I, I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I know that we are going to have to, like Trish said, start a baseline because it's just the pandemic just messed our whole, all the numbers up. So. Um, Anyway, but I'm, I'm happy to see this, and I appreciate all the hard work that you guys do and really are there for our kids to help them succeed. M one of the things that I think about is, you know, I know as a kid, when I was a kid, I'd be embarrassed to say, I don't understand this. And so I, I think about that kid in school. What if they say, like, I don't understand this, and it, is it the test scores that they, you know, you guys focus on that kid and say, hey, we know you're, you're struggling with this, you maybe need to take this uh, tutoring or something. Do you guys do that? Do you know what I mean? 
Yeah, I, I would say that one of the benefits to the tools that we have, and these are incredible tools because they're intuitive. Mm -hmm. They meet the kids where they're, mat, where they're at and they mm -hmm. address those specific skills. So the student that might be reluctant to admit, hey, I don't get yeah. this, they're doing, they're actually able to get that access through those different tools that we use. Okay, great, that's awesome, thank you. Thank you. I do have some comments, some concerns, some questions. Um, I'm looking at uh, the provide every site a seven hour intervention specialist. So this is just one teacher per school. Is that what we're doing? And Cor so is this, so if, if I'm the intervention specialist for that school, I'm obviously going to pull the diagnostic results on iReady. I'm going to look at which tier they're on. Are we focusing on the red, the yellow, the green? What are we focused, obviously not the green. What are What is the focus? Is it just the ones that are almost there or the ones that need the intensive intervention? I think that is determined at, at each site how they're going to roll out their intervention specialists. Mm -hmm. And some sites have more than one. We provide a one person per site, but many sites have more than one. So the way it looks is they just, they tier their, their intervention and in, in to support, the goal is to support all students, right? So a lot, a lot of the things that we talked about tonight are tier one supports that all of our students are getting. Um, and through that intervention specialist, they're tiering their same support. So those students that are in the red, they need additional um, extra, extra time is getting, are getting that through one of the intervention specialists and then another one may be providing those students that are in the middle, kind of in that yellow area, the yellow band that just needs a little bit of boosting up. So the goal is to provide that for all students, but it does look a little different at every site depending on how many uh, intervention specialists they have. Just for just to, for example, some sites are, are not doing math yet. Uh, they, they don't have the personnel for math, but they're doing it through, throughout the classroom where some sites have one for math and one for uh, reading, so. Okay, a concern there sometimes is you get a program and everybody's doing it a little different. And I understand that every school site is a little bit different. So that is a concern. Also the coaching, um, they will get a coach to support teachers with coaching. And, and I understand that that is important and I know that we do have PLCs as you mentioned here. We have PLCs, we have SAS time. I'm just thinking that maybe take that coach. What happens a lot of times is these coaches are become kind of pseudo admin at the sites. They become substitute teachers. They become um, lunchtime monitors. They're pulled for different things. And many times they end up doing other things. It, it would be preferable to have this position become another intervention that actually deals with students. Because at this point, I do understand we have a lot of seasoned teachers. We do have beginning teachers. Most of them have, you know, some type of a bits of support. We have the PLCs where they can get and professional development as well. It just, I think, our biggest bang for our buck, I guess you could say, would be to actually have them work with the students, not Man. so much the teachers. So all of our coaches are trained in all of the same programs that we're using for intervention, so they all have the knowledge. And, and I have to say that most of them are part are, in, are a part of the process, supporting the intervention specialists um, in the classroom with those students, but also supporting the teachers as well. Um, so they have a they have a huge role in it. May, they may not be. Well, for example, today I was at at Washington Charter uh, Elementary School, and their instructional coach was providing as one of the rotation stations was providing supports in intervention for the student. So I, I, I believe that our interventions at the elementary school, our interventions, or I'm sorry, our instructional coaches are, are a huge part of that whole process and have the same training as the intervention teachers as well. It would just be nice to see them work with the students is, is my concern because it, it does happen. It happens where they become pseudo admin and more than we'd like to see. Um, but it, it is a good plan. I'm glad we did get the baseline. We knew that COVID had impacted all aspects of academics. Now we have the data. Now we know where to start, where to go from. So thank you for your presentation. And I just want to add um, just one little thing, because one of the, uh, as we're building our, our tier two supports, and you, and you had mentioned um, 
sites doing different things. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I'm really excited about is that's what we're streamlining. That's what we're trying to do is align all of our intervention to be universal. So what they're getting at one school is going to be the same as that they're getting at a different school. Whereas in the past, the school it was up to the schools to decide how they were going to provide that intervention and what programs they were using. So I think we're making great strides in making sure that all of our students that need that support are getting the consistent support um, with the same program throughout the district so we can see which ones are successful and which ones are not working. So we're excited about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to item 14, public hearing. There is none. Thank you for your presentation. Moving on, item 15, board and superintendent comments. Ms. Pierce. This past couple weeks, I was actually at an unrelated um, from the district, but it was a California Retired Teachers Association lunch luncheon meeting, and there was a speaker from a place just as we have the uh, Old Town Artisan Studio. It it really interested me for the need that kids have for arts and and um, music type uh, experiences, and it's a place called Create. Create Center for Arts. They took over some little doggy spa. <laughs> Huge place on Alessandro in Palm Desert and 20,000 square feet. They have different rooms dealing with all types of arts. They have scholarships, they have field trips, and they have um, classes that they can take and they, they do uh, give quite a few scholarships out for free experiences in art. And so I was just really, I missed their open house the other evening. But um, it's something that I would say for parents and community to check out because I think that any time we can have a place for kids to go and be creative and go with their passion, it would be great. And they're also taking donations of art things. They even have like a little art thrift store. So like people that, you know, you have art things that you don't need, you can donate. I also was fortunate to go to the Aziz Farms, our partner for our um, harvest boxes. And they were having an educator's day on Sunday and trying to showcase their farm with different stations and experiences for kids to take part in to see the farm to table type of um, uh, thing that we're uh, fortunate to have in our area being that we're an agricultural area as well. So you should you know, check that out if your teachers and parents that can suggest that, the kids would love it. Um, we also attended the Riverside County Office of Education, a joint fall conference, which was really good because I learned that it's between San Bernardino County and Riverside County, and that we have, um, of the six million kids in California that are in school, those two counties have one million. We have one million kids. And we are number four and five in the size of districts. I mean, the number of students that we have, number four and five in the state. So we are a large, large area with San Bernardino and Riverside County. And the fact that these two places get together and they talk about issues and things that are affecting us and we, we keep up to date on um, what's going on, especially they talked about how much they how much they worked together during the COVID time and figuring out how to work things and how everything is going to move forward now in a more um, normal fashion. So it was a good experience to go to that meeting yesterday in Riverside. And that's, I didn't get to any school visits this time, but that's all I've done. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Porras. Well, the only thing I want to say is when I'm driving around Indio, um, I notice our buses and I just want to give a shout out to our school bus drivers and our school buses, and they always look great. They always are clean, squeaky clean, shiny, and um, I just, anyway, I'm just really proud of our, our school buses and our bus drivers. You know, the bus driver is the first person that a lot of our students see beginning of the day and the last person at the end of the day. And um, anyway, I just want to acknowledge them and just give them a shout out. So that's all. Thank you. The superintendent, Dr. May Vollmer. Yeah, thank you. I actually um, spent some time in the transportation department last week for school bus safety 
um, celebration, and I actually said that exact same thing to our bus drivers, that they're, they're bookends for our students in a wonderful way that they get to start their day with them and end their day with them, and uh, it was really amazing to spend some time with all of them, value the work that they do so very much. I wanted to share uh, one piece of information um, for the community because I received some notification from the Registrar of Voters regarding the upcoming board seats uh, that will be on the ballot in the election in November. And so I wanted to share that uh, with the community at large in case there were any questions. So Kylie Watson is running unopposed for trustee area one. And we were notified uh, by the Registrar of Voters that no one submitted a write-in candidacy by the deadline, which was August 17th. And so based on election code and the fact that she was unopposed and no one submitted a write-in candidacy, that dictates that she will not appear on the ballot because she's already the uncontested winner of that trustee area. And so there had been some phone calls um, asking why her name was not on the ballot, and that is why. So she will be sworn in uh, during the district's organizational meeting, which is scheduled to be held within the district, so thank you. And we are moving on to item 16, public comment on open session items. There are no online comments. I have a statement to read before I open up public comments. Ed Code 7054, prohibiting political statements at board meetings. Pursuant to Education Code 7054, the district is prohibited from expending any resources directly or indirectly to urge the support or defeat of any ballot measure or candidate for elective office, including candidates for the Board of Education. This means that the district must ensure no funds, supplies, equipment, monetary expenses, or manpower are used or expended for political purposes. These rules are applied equally upon any and all candidates and incumbents. Accordingly, since holding a board meeting involves district resources for staff, utilities, etc., public comment at a board meeting shall not include any statement that may reasonably be construed as urging the support or defeat of any candidate for election or any ballot measure. Okay, and since we have no online comments, I'll proceed to the end floor comments. Communications from the floor. In accordance with bylaws of the board 9323, time is reserved for oral communications by members of the Board of Education or by citizens present. Citizens wishing to be heard on agenda items, regular or special meetings, and or non-agenda items within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board, regular meetings only, shall have a three minute limit in accordance with the law. The board cannot take action on any item not appearing on the agenda as indicated in bylaws of the board 9323.2. The first person is Patel Sturgeon. Oh, Peter, I'm sorry. Thank you. With the Ophelia Foundation. Yes. Good evening, board and uh, cabinet. My name is Peter Sturgeon, and I am the chief executive officer of the John F. Kennedy Memorial Foundation home of the Ophelia Project. I'm here tonight with a small sampling of the stakeholders who are involved uh, putting on the Ophelia Project. And we're here to thank you for your long and ongoing support of our Ophelia girls. The Ophelia Project is a proven mentoring program where women in our community are trained to come alongside at-risk teen girls in middle school and high school from eighth grade to seniors and through mentoring, help change the trajectory of these young women. Ophelia was launched in the Coachella Valley right here in the Desert Sands Unified School District. In 1999, we started with one school, Indio Middle School, with three volunteers and five girls. We now are in 18 schools throughout the valley, including 10 schools right here in the district. Pre-COVID, we had 600 girls enrolled in all the schools throughout the valley. Since our founding 23 years ago, Ophelia Project has had 100% success getting our enrollees, our girls, to graduate high school with, I might add, an average GPA of 3.99, a significant GPA increase from their GPA at entry to the Ophelia program. And then they're on to higher education opportunities and productive, meaningful lives. After two years of virtual mentoring, I'm thrilled to announce that starting in January, we are back in the classrooms in DSUSD 
serving 200 girls. It truly takes a village to educate children, and we are delighted and grateful that you let us be part of that village. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next is Ginny Whitman. Um, first of all, I want to say I'm so glad I wore blue today, so. <laughs> and I applaud the effort, and I know I would have made sure I did, but anyway, um, I'm Jenny Whitman, and I want to thank you, first of all, for giving us this opportunity to talk to you about the Ophelia Project. I'm a mentor with Ophelia, and I'm just starting my seventh year at La Quinta High School. I'm also a retired attorney. And my husband and I moved to the Coachella Valley from Cincinnati, Ohio about eight years ago. And when I moved here, I was looking for something meaningful to do, a hands-on way to get involved with the community and use what I thought were my, some skills and experience to make a difference. And I found that way through Ophelia. I was among the group of mentors who introduced Ophelia to La Quinta High School. And at the beginning, many of our girls really weren't sure why they were there or what it was that um, Ophelia had to offer them. But I will tell you that seven years later, our Ophelia, Ophelia girls have a very deep and profound understanding of why they're there and what Ophelia can do for them. Um, during the pandemic, pandemic, we were a lifeline to the girls shut up in their homes. I'm lucky enough to serve on a team with two other committed mentors, and the three of us show up time after time just to love and support the girls. One of the penultimate moments for me was our last Ophelia session last spring. After two years of meeting these girls via Zoom and behind masks, La Quinta High School had opened up a bit, and our counselor mm -hmm. invited us to come for the last session. We wanted to surprise the girls, so we didn't tell them we were coming. And as each arrived for what they thought was another Zoom meeting, they saw us and almost all of them burst into tears and came running over to meet us in person. We followed that with a session on gratitude, and we didn't know they were just going to talk about Ophelia, but that's what they talked about. All of them, how grateful they were for Ophelia, how grateful they were for us and for the sisters that they had found through the Ophelia program. I had a girl tell me that I had saved her life, and another girl tell me that God had sent me to her. That's the kind of stuff that keeps me and all of the mentors coming back time and time again. And I'm telling you that not to tell you how wonderful I am, but how wonderful the girls are. Many, as you know, have complicated life issues, and it takes a lot of courage for them to open themselves up and their hearts up to this. So I, closing, I would just say it's been a complete privilege for me to have served the girls. They have so much promise, so much love in their hearts, and I do believe that Ophelia helps them become their best selves. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Lupe Mares. I'm nervous, but after watching Amnesty at Young People, oh my gosh, they're awesome. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Lupe Mares, and I am a school counselor at Thomas Jefferson Middle School. I'd like to thank the Board of Trustees for your support to the Ophelia Project. I have been the on-site coordinator um, for the Ophelia Project at Jefferson Middle for 18 years now, and I am very passionate for this program. My girls know that. Um, I, too, am a product of DSUSD. I attended um, Wilson Middle School, actually, and then Indio High School. Um, what I look for in Ophelia candidates is primarily that the eighth grade young lady is willing to participate and commit to the program. I initially invite the girls to an orientation as the seventh grade, um, as the seventh grade year ends, and so that way they can hear all about what Ophelia Project is, what it offers, uh, the program's expectations, as well as what they in return will gain. Therefore, their participation and commitment means attendance, being on time to every session, making an effort to participate in group discussions, being respectful towards others and of others. 
The Ophelia, what I have seen is that Ophelia's impact on girls is so much more than what I can express in words. It truly builds positive self-esteem, empowers the girls to have a sense of self-worth, and it teaches them skills to thrive and believe in their own ability to be unstoppable. And in a minute, you will obviously hear from one of my young ladies um, that also attended Jefferson Middle. And I meant to say uh, to, uh, Zoe. Zoe was actually Ophelia when she was at Jefferson Middle, so I am so proud to see her up here. I had not seen her in many years, so that my heart just really was, oh my goodness. Um, Let's see, I personally have seen in my 18 years of being the on-site Ophelia coordinator at Jefferson Middle so much growth in the girls' self-esteem, levels of maturity, responsibility, involvement and participation in many activities. Parents also share with me the difference that they've noticed in their daughters at home, and they attribute this, and they attribute a huge part of this positivity and growth to the Ophelia Project. Ophelia has helped me as a school counselor to continue building positive relationships with my students, their parents, and my staff as I advocate and recruit the girls every year. It helps me build positive relationships with the mentors whom I truly love and respect for their time, commitment, and countless efforts that they put forth to also establish relationships with the girls. My overall experience with the Ophelia Project has been incredibly amazing. I honestly am very passionate about Ophelia program at my school site because I know the miraculous wonders that it does in a young girl's life. From the quiet introvert girls that grow into confident and social little butterflies participating as they otherwise were not, to girls that lack self-control and are fast to react, they learn to stop and think before reacting. I value what each mentor has to offer the girls. The mentors build strong and positive connections with them. This is obvious as the program nears to the end. The girls are always asking the mentors, please don't let the program end. Um, and I know I was reading off of this because at first I was very <laughs> nervous, but Ophelia to me has touched my heart for so many years and I'm very, very um, thankful to all my administration in the past years, from Ms. Lopez to Ms. McCormick to now my new admin. So supportive and obviously um, the Board of Trustees. Thank you, really Ms. Maris. Thank you. Okay. Next, Jennifer. And I'm afraid I'll mispronounce your last name. Brocha. Brocha. Okay. Thank you. I know, it happened all through my school years. <laughs> <laughs> Still happens now. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, I want to thank the Board of Trustees, first of all. So I didn't come prepared. I was just like, I'm just going to blurt it out. <laughs> so a little bit about me. I attended all Desert Sands Unified School District schools from Van Buren to... Thomas Jefferson, Indio High School. Um, first and foremost, a uh, little bit about me. I currently graduated UC San Diego with my bachelor's in sociology. Um, I am now in law enforcement. And today I just got my acceptance into Cal State Dominguez Hills for my master's degree. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so to start off, a little bit about me. Um, I did start off as a migrant farm worker with my parents. They're still both um, migrant farm workers. So for me, that was my biggest motivation, you know? And in middle school, when I heard about the Ophelia Project, I was like, hmm, I wonder what that is all about. So once I joined, I realized like, wow, like this is a room full of like females. So it made me feel like more empowered to like do something in this world. Because you know, being a female, you know, you hear all these like biases and stuff and stereotypes. So I then, throughout high school, I stuck with Ophelia and then I became an ambassador because I wanted to be more. I wanted to do more. I wanted to reach out to the community and tell them all about Ophelia. So then uh, we were lucky enough to run the lunches as ambassadors and through there, you know, I met so many connections, networking, and I could honestly say that Ophelia helped me become the female that I am now. It helped me to jump, take risks, and, you know, at first it was, it was a hurdle because coming from, you know, Mexican background, it's, it's, it's already tough enough. And then being a female, even worse. Um, so you can imagine that once I said I wanted to do law enforcement, all the negative comments I got. Um, however, now my goal is, you know, to be an impact out there and to just be able to change the negative connotation that law enforcement has nowadays. Um, but then again, I still come back because I want to, 
bring awareness to you guys about the Ophelia Project because to me it impacted me and it made me become the female that I am now. And if I'm able to just give a little bit of motivation to female girls right now during high school, middle school, especially high school since they're getting to that point of like going to college, just motivating them like saying, hey, you got this. And just because you're a female doesn't mean anything. The sky's the limit. And like my dad says in Spanish, get it as poder. So if you want it, you could do it. So I thank you guys. Thank you. Next is Kathleen Fitzpatrick. Good evening. I'm here with um, two hats. Um, I'm a former mentor for Ophelia, but I'm also uh, mayor pro tem for the city council for the city of La Quinta. And Peter asked me to come tonight because a couple of weeks ago, uh, Ophelia came to us and, and we awarded them a grant to get back into the schools and get active in La Quinta. Ophelia, as you've heard and you probably all know, is very important in our community. And our city council supports our schools probably at least as much, if not more, than most cities in the, in the valley. And it's very important that this continues. So I want to thank you for your support. I want to thank you for completing the MOU again this year and bringing Ophelia back into the schools. It's all about the community. And when you listen to the young women, like the young woman that just spoke, it's, it's moving. I mean, I, after she spoke, I threw out what I was going to say. <laughs> it's, it's, it's too important. Uh, these young women, uh, in combination with your staff, helping the Ophelia people pick out the girls that are going to go through the program and work with the mentors, to, to encourage the mentors retired women like me and that's kind of how I got involved in part of the community in the in the Coachella Valley after I retired was to join Ophelia as a mentor to get these women exposed to multiple careers that they can pursue not you know not just the normal ones that we all think of but to give them that incentive to be able to move forward to get that community feedback we have a lot of incredibly talented people in this city and and throughout the valley and to have those women interact with young women who just need a leg up is is important and it's wonderful and it's wonderful to see them grow into people who come back and talk to the community and and explain how how they succeeded. It's, it's moving and, and I just am so excited that you're back in support and, and going to help us make it back into the, into the future. COVID took a big toll uh, out of the number of mentors that we had. So I, you know, if you know people who have the time and the inclination, please have them get in touch with Peter and, and come back into, into being mentors with these young women. It's really important. So thank you again. Thank you all for your service. I'm a retired public servant, so uh, <laughs> thank you all for your service. I know it's hard sometimes to be up there, and, and I just we all appreciate it, and thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Erica Felci. Sorry to break the Ophelia chain here. <laughs> um, honorable board members, uh, families of Desert Sands, cabinet, staff. My name is Erica Felci. I'm the Assistant Executive Director at the Coachella Valley Association of Governments. And you may remember me from May when I came to your board um, and told you a little bit about a project called the Arts and Music Line and this crazy idea we had about building another bike path here in the Coachella Valley. And um, uh, Madam President, earlier you mentioned that uh, a lot of good things are happening in this district that need to be recognized. And that's why I'm here, because you may have seen our good news. Uh, the state of California is recommending us for $36.5 million in active transportation funding for this project. And we couldn't have done it without you. So thank you for your support and the support of councils like La Quinta, I think the mayor pro tem just left, but she's a huge champion of active transportation 
and um, we're really excited about this project. And I just wanted to really come and say thank you and warn the staff that you're gonna be seeing us quite a bit <laughs> as we not only build this project, but look to bring it to life. Um, the arts and music line does connect the cities of La Quinta, Indio, and Coachella. It's about 15 miles, I'm still good on time. Um, it uses bold color schemes, innovative lighting, a lot of artwork. And we're going to build connections to CV Link. We're going to build connections down to the Polo Grounds. And we're going to build connections to our neighborhoods. So kids like um, my son can, can ride, walk, and enjoy our communities in a safe and inviting manner. So I look forward to bringing lots more updates as we build this project. And thanks in advance to the community for your patience during construction. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Dale Wiseman. Dale Wiseman. It's good to see Erica back. She was a great Desert Suns reporter back in the day, if you remember, and it's good to see her in her, her role over there. Uh, we have some classified employees here tonight. I'd like to recognize them. Paraeducators are amongst the most difficult people to hire. You guys have no idea how lucky you are to have this group here. Can the paraeducators stand up that are here tonight? Where are the paraeducators tonight? Okay. In light of what even just McDonald's down at the freeway is paying, or the $17 an hour signs at Target, or the $22 an hour uh, for certain kinds of semi-skilled fast food, most districts cannot hire paraeducators. Um, I could stand here for 50 minutes and just tell you the litany of horror stories in Southern California. 50 paraeducators down. 200 paraeducators down in districts your sizes where they can't hire them and they're not running program and there's 18, 20 lawsuits backed up. Um, we had a very productive day at the table trying to adjust some of the uh, paraeducator uh, classifications, looking at salaries and how we kind of divide up that work. Uh, it is an extraordinarily difficult department uh, to hire for uh, there are, paraeducators just kind of a catch-all term, right? There are many, many different kinds of paraeducators. Uh, and we're going to need more, and we're going to need to hire probably over 100 into the, uh, just, just to be the kindergarten needs. And that means with teachers across the Coachella Valley, you're looking at 750 to even 1,000 hires in the three districts. There's no world where that exists in the Coachella Valley with 240 or 50,000 full-time residents to find another six, seven, 800 people. So you want to take care of the paraeducators you have because when they go, you usually can't get them back. Luckily here, we still pay, we have the benefits package that really works because we still have that Kaiser plan and the 6.5 hour. So we did a lot of work for literally over a decade to get to this point where we're not, you know, hopefully, if we stay out in front of it, we'll not have that labor crunch and labor shortage at Desert Sands. I, I kind of feel sorry for the other two districts on either side of us. They're gonna, they need to get with it at this point. And, but I want to recognize that Desert Sands has done a great job you know, taking care of paraeducators, para making it a great place to work, and we, we need to continue that, and that's been a lot of the focus at the negotiations table. I really, really want to recognize, you know, Dr. Hyde, Chad Wood, Jordan, the folks that have to sit at the table and kind of work this these very difficult details out, and the entire CSA and Desert Sands team. So thank you, paraeducators, for coming out tonight. Next is Ursula Leguello. Good evening, board. Tonight I wear two hats. As a CSEA chief union steward, I educate classified unit employees about their rights under the contract and determine how problems arise under the contract can be best handled. Often I act as a channel of communication between employees and the district. Now my second hat. Paraeducators, I'm a paraeducator, 
are assigned to perform duties of a higher classification, and often we perform the work without any compensation. Paraeducators feel stretched thin and feel, and feel when asked to go above and beyond and perform out-of-class work. We feel it's overly difficult to be compensated. Difference in a pay for working out of class for a para can be as little as $8 a day. But the appreciation and recognition that we step up to help our students is worth more than that. I encourage the district to closely look into the issues of working out of class concerns many, many paraeducators face. For example, classroom paras frequently are being pulled to be one-on-one -on -one paras. So please value the work and give compensation to those parents who are deserving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item 17, general functions, business services. Second reading of the Ordinance of Community Facilities District Number 2022-1 of the Desert Sands Unified School District, authorizing the levy of special tax taxes within CFD Number 2022-1. In reference to Item 17.1, tonight we will conduct the second reading of an ordinance levying the special taxes in CFD Number 2022-1. Immediately after the second reading, this ordinance will be considered for adoption. Is there a motion to read the ordinance by the title only? Is there a second? Second, Trisha Pierce. It has been moved and seconded to read the ordinance by title only. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? This motion carries. The motion is approved. Will the secretary to the board please present the second reading of the ordinance by reading the ordinance title only. The title of the ordinance is Ordinance of Community Facilities District Number 2022-1 of the Desert Sands Unified School District authorizing the levy of special taxes within the CFD number 2022-1. The board will now consider adoption of the ordinance of CFD number 2022-1 of the Desert Sands Unified School District authorizing the levy of special taxes within CFD number 2022-1. By adopting this ordinance, the board authorizes a levy of special taxes within CFD number 2022-1 at the rate set forth in the rate and method of apportionment attached to the ordinance. Is there a motion to adopt the ordinance of CFD number 2022-1? So moved in the board. Is there a second? Second, Trisha Pierce. It has been moved and seconded to adopt this ordinance. Is there any discussion? Here, none calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? This motion carries. Copies of this ordinance are available at the district's business office for inspection by any interested member of the public. Matters related to the CFD number 2022-1 scheduled for tonight are now complete and the board will now resume acting in its capacity as a governing board of the school district. There are three items left in item 17, point, and 17 general functions business services. Is there a motion to take these items as a group or individually? Make a motion to take 17.2 to 17.4 as a group. Is, there it is. It has been moved and seconded to take item 17.2 through 17.4 as a group. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? This motion carries. Moving on to item 18, general functions, educational services. There are four items in general function, educational services. Is there a motion to take items 18.1 through 18.4 as a group or individually? I move to take 18.1 to 18.4 as a group. Is there a second? It has been moved and seconded to take these items as a group. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? This motion carries. <coughs> Moving on, item 19, general functions, personnel services. There are three items in general functions, personnel services. Is there a motion to take items 19.1 through 19.3 as a group or individually? Make a motion to take 19.1 to 19.3 as a group. 
Is there a second? It has been moved and seconded to take these items as a group. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? This motion carries. <laughs> Item 20, General Function Student Support Services. There are two items in General Function Student Support Services. Is there a motion to take items 20.1 and 20.2 as a group or individually? A motion to take 20.1 and 2 as a group. Is there a second? Second, Linda Porras. It has been moved and seconded to take these items as a group. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? This motion carries. Item 21, general function superintendent. There are none. Item 22, consent item student matters. There are none. Moving on to item 23, consent items business services. There are 18 items in consent items business services. Is there a motion to take items 23.1 to 23.18 as a group or individually? Move that we take um, them as a group. Linda there is a second. Second, Tricia Pierce. It has been moved and seconded to take items 23.1 to 23.18 as a group. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? This motion carries. Moving on, item 24, consent items educational services. There are only nine items in consent items educational services. Is there a motion to take items 24.1 through 24.9 as a group or individually? I move to take 24.1 to 24.9 as a group. Is there a second? It has been moved and seconded to take items 24.1 through 24.9 as a group. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? This motion carries. <laughs> item 25, consent items personnel services. There are none. Moving on to item 26, consent item student support services. There are two items in consent item student support services. Is there a motion to take items 26.1 and 26.2 as a group or individually? Move to take 26.1 and 2 as a group. Tricia Pierce. It has been moved and seconded to take these items as a group. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? This motion carries. Item 27, consent item superintendent. There are none. Moving on to item 28, personnel action certificated. Dr. Hyde, do you have any items? I, I do. I actually have a blind appointment in the certificated section. Um, under uh, item 28.1, agenda item numbers 8 and 9 on page 2, we are pleased to recommend the appointment of Dr. Dan Borgen to the position of Director of Personnel Leadership Development. We are also pleased to recommend the appointment of Linda Farias to the position of Psychologist. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve items 28.1, Certificated Personnel? Is there a second? Second, Tricia Pierce. It has been moved and seconded to approve item 28.1, certificated personnel. Is there any discussion? Do we have any retirements? We do, actually. We have uh, one retirement from Page Middle School. That's uh, Veronique Lordell, and she's retiring after 17 years of service to the district. Nice. Congratulations to her. Is there any other comments or questions? Hearing none. Calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? This motion carries. <laughs> Moving on, item 29, personnel actions classified. Dr. Hyde, do you have any items? No items, just in a retirement to announce. And so, again, I'd like to uh, uh, congratulate Del Martinson from Shadow Hills High School, who is retiring after serving as a paraeducation, paraeducator, special education, severely disabled and served um, the district for 15 years. Ah, congratulations. Is there a motion to approve item 29.1, classified personnel? Is there a second? Second, Tricia Pierce. It has been moved and seconded to approve item 29.1, classified personnel. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Any abstentions? This motion carries. Item 30, call out of closed session actions. Dr. May Vollmer. Uh, yes, we have four items. Tonight in closed session, the board took action to approve 3.1. General Release and Settlement Agreement SSS number 8 slash 2022 2023 on a motion made by Linda Porras, seconded by Patricia Pierce. The motion carried 3 0. Item 3.2 General Release and Settlement Agreement SSS number 9 slash 2022 2023 on a motion made by Linda Porras and seconded by Patricia Pierce. The motion carried 3 0. And item 3.3, General Release and Settlement Agreement SSS number 10 slash 2022-2023 on a motion made by Patricia Pierce, seconded by Linda Porras. The motion carried 3-0. And then listed under closed session tonight, item number 3.4, the board took action on settlement claim number 21-L-009 on a motion made by Linda Porras and seconded by Patricia Pierce. The motion carried 3-0, and the board took action to approve the settlement claim, number 21-L-009. Thank you. Moving on to number 31, suggestions for future agendas that receive at least three votes. Ms. Pierce, do you have any? I have none. Ms. Porras? I have none, but I just have a question. Um, the Ophelia Project is amazing, and it's wonderful for our girls and i'm curious do we have anything for our boys do we? we do it's called the gents alliance and we've uh, recently last couple years it's just existed over at indio high school but it's expanded this year uh, in fact there's an action in our lcap for it uh, so it's at the other high schools and Dr. Gustafson works closely with them on getting that up and running, and our counselor on special assignment, uh, Ralph Ray, has also uh, helped support that. And I have none, thank you. Item 32, announcements. The next regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Education is November 15, 2022, in the District Education Center Boardroom, 47950 Dune Palm Roads, La Quinta, California. I also want to thank the LCAP lady, <laughs> which is what that nice thick packet of reading material I received tonight. Thank you for that. Candy. It, it did come with candy. It did come with so candy. It makes it a little bit sweeter. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on to item 33, reconvene to closed session if needed. There is not a need to reconvene to closed session. Item 34, adjournment. This meeting is adjourned at 8.39 p.m. Thank you, everybody, and have a good night.